Hi, guys. I think everybody's sort of dispersed. They're like, J-Lo, who's that? <laughs> um, and I don't know if some of you want to come sit down or no, <laughs> or sit down somewhere. Um, well, thank you for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I'm recognizing some other data knots in the audience. Hi. Hello. Um, I was actually, um, I had first participated in, uh, as part of the founding uh, class of the Data Knots back uh, a couple years ago at Women in Data Science uh, boot camp. It was a conference um, that opened the hackathon a couple years ago. So it's nice to come back and see you guys again. Um, so I know you've heard a lot uh, this morning from uh, our, our amazing astronauts, and you've heard some information about the International Space Station. And what I'm going to do is go a little bit deeper uh, in terms of what we do on the space station, um, why, why it's so, such a unique opportunity, and, uh, and, and how the space station can potentially be driving new innovations and possible breakthroughs that are just not possible here on Earth. Uh, and as you know, the, the space station, uh, as you've heard from this morning, the, the space station is uh, one of the, the greatest uh, uh, technological achievements in human history. Uh, you know how expensive it was to, to build, as you heard from Richard earlier. And it's actually more, I would, I would even claim it's more than 50 billion. Um, there's uh, um, stats that say that it's upwards to 160 plus billion. So that makes it even that much more important for us to make sure that we're utilizing it or maximizing uh, the platform for our benefit. So before I get into all of that, um, I'm actually going to give you just a brief background in terms of where I grew up and, and how all of that um, uh, contributes to what I do today uh, for, for the space station and for cases, which I'll also tell you about a little bit later. So uh, I grew up in Texas, and you can see um, with my bold outfit and my choice of standing on my bike, I was very naturally very adventurous, curious, always exploring. But it wasn't until um, I actually had uh, gone to my elementary school in Texas, uh, Scobie Elementary School, uh, where I first became interested in space exploration. And because the school was named after uh, Commander Francis R. Scobie from the uh, Challenger or space, sh space Shuttle Challenger mission in 1986, uh, that I actually really, really became uh, that much more interested in space, science, technology. And this is actually the, the class you can see me to, to the right uh, with the arrow with all of my fellow second graders and third graders. And um, I was just so excited about science, technology. I, I'm going to put a little inset there so you can see with my pink glasses, remember those. Um, and, and this was when I was participating in hackathons, in science fairs. You name it, I participated in it. I loved everything about science, technology, et cetera. And I actually still have, uh, this is from what I was mentioning to you when I participated in the Women in Data uh, conference a couple years ago for space apps. I was showing my t-shirt at that conference, and I still have that t-shirt today. So that's a t-shirt that I wore from the Young Astronauts program in second grade. And through all of this, this is what really led me um, in terms of my path uh, to go towards science. I was interested in chemistry, physics, uh, biology, went into uh, molecular and microbiology and worked in the lab uh, for about four years, did a lot of gel electrophoresis, and then I realized after that time, I said, you know, I don't know if I want to stay in, you know, behind a lab bench for 30 years. I love, I still very much love uh, biology and molecular biology, but I think I want to, you know, be, uh, have much more trajectory and, and try to segue out. So I was leaving that, uh, the lab behind, leaving my path toward a PhD behind, went into business, uh, media, marketing, worked with a number of science and technology uh, startups and nonprofit organizations, international relations. And uh, then I continued on that path uh, to work with uh, other science and technology nonprofits, also with an additive manufacturing company for a period of time. And all of that has really led me to, my, uh, to what I currently do today, for, uh, for the space station and for CASIS. So all of these things that I've done in the past, they've all sort of culminated and they're all, uh, they've converged to, to my role and to what I do as the commercial innovation technology lead for, for CASIS. So um, as I mentioned earlier, when I first uh, opened uh, the, the presentation, I was mentioning about the, the importance of the space station. And what, what exactly are we doing up there in terms of benefiting our planet and why is this so unique? So to kick off that uh, portion, I'm going to show you a quick video, and then we can, we can take it from there. 
D minus 10. We have made it. Booster ignition. One. Ignition. Let's clear the tower. So to put it into perspective, uh, the space station is about the size of a football field, as you can see, uh, and including the solar arrays. The solar arrays actually themselves are about eight basketball courts to also give you the, the, the surface area uh, uh, perspective as well. So uh, it's, it's equivalent to the size of a five-bedroom house, has two bathrooms, and I was listening to what Richard was mentioning earlier about the bathrooms, so you can imagine <laughs> the, the, the tight quarters that that's in. Um, it has a gym. And of course, you know, it sounds quite spacious in terms of the as a five bedroom house, but you have to cram our astronauts, our cosmonauts, thousands of pounds of experiments, uh, supplies, food, et cetera, all in this uh, orbiting laboratory that's going around our planet. Uh oh. And um, let's see, okay, I'm making sure this works. So in 2005, uh, US Congress uh, declared with NASA the U.S. segment of the International Space Station to be a, a, a national laboratory. And that really opened the door, set the stage for private industry, other government agencies, academia, to really start to utilize this platform for, for multiple benefits. And NASA also trying to use it for deep space exploration missions or trying to investigate certain projects to really help on that path to journey to Mars, et cetera. Um, and then in 2011, uh, through, a, uh, through U.S. Congress, a bipartisan cooperative agreement, uh, they tasked NASA to, uh, to assign an organization to manage the ISS National Laboratory, and CASIS uh, was uh, selected to, to do just that. And uh, so that started in 2011. CASIS assumed that role. And, and through that, um, CASIS has uh, designated these five key verticals uh, to really focus on for uh, the utilization of, of the space station, life sciences, physical sciences, education, which is a pillar of, of our work, remote sensing, technology development, all to benefit our, our life here on Earth. And ultimately, uh, the goal is to really maximize, like I said, the utilization of the laboratory uh, to have a major impact on uh, future economic, uh, economic activity in low Earth orbit, where the, the space station currently resides, and really inspire the next generation of researchers and technologists and all of these other um, stats that you see up here as well to really try to aim high uh, with the time that we have in terms of the space station. So I'm gonna go into a little bit more information about CASIS in terms of what we've done to this point, giving you some historical context. And then I'm gonna go through each of those verticals that you just saw really briefly uh, at a high level to show you some snapshots of experimentation and what we're really doing to, to maximize this orbiting laboratory. So you can see the awarded projects to date. We've awarded almost 200, uh, 200 projects. And you can see the breakdown in terms of all of the verticals that I, that I showed you, physical sciences, technology development, education, life sciences, et cetera. And this shows you the ecosystem that we've built, a number of different companies uh, with our, our partnerships in terms of commercial facilities, our hardware that we have on the space station, uh, our sponsored programs that we've developed with a number of partnering organizations, and you can see a lot of the, the uh, or sort of a sampling of, of some of our co uh, com commercial customers. And also on the right side, our investor network. We have a pretty robust network of investors that are uh, working with us as well. And this gives you a, a little bit more of a snapshot of the types of companies that we're working with and, and some of the areas that they're looking at in life sciences, physical sciences, tech dev, remote sensing. Normally I go through some of these and give you some examples, but it's, if you have any questions, I can talk to you after the presentation since I only have a little bit of time left. 
And again, deeping a little bit or diving a little bit deeper into uh, the each project vertical to show you the types of experimentation that we're working on, and also what's on the horizon. So then you can get a sense of some of the companies that we're talking to, where these companies are interested in um, in flying projects to the space station. They are currently planning to fly projects to the space station, or will be engaging in some sort of experimentation uh, fairly soon. And because of that designation through US Congress, uh, CASIS and the ISS National Lab, we provide a host of benefits for our customers. So we give you access to, to our national laboratory. You know, you get access to astronaut crew time, which is very precious, very expensive. Uh, access to NASA facilities to potentially do additional ground experimentation or research and your transportation. So you get access to uh, the rockets that can take your experiment to the space station, you know, the rocket ride up and the rocket ride back to bring any samples uh, back to Earth. And what we really talk about when it comes to our uh, commercial customers, we really try to highlight that it's first and foremost about the science. So these are the key areas that we really try to drive home to show that what, what exactly is really unique up there and, and what, what is it that, that we bring to the table in terms of uh, particular benefits uh, as far as the, uh, the unique environment that you have access to. And it's microgravity, vantage point, Earth observation. So microgravity, I'll go into a little bit about that later in terms of lack of convection, sedimentation, and buoyancy. Vantage point, Earth observation. So the space station, it's you know, flying around the Earth at 17,000, between 17,000, uh, 150 miles per hour to 17,500 miles per hour. Has an orbital path over 90% of the Earth's population and um, you can as assume that you know, with that, you see a lot of sunsets and sunrises because it's orbiting every 90 minutes around the Earth. And of course, you have access to the extreme conditions of space. So extreme hot and cold cycling on the sun-facing side, it can reach up to 250 degrees uh, Fahrenheit plus, And on the other side, negative uh, 250 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Of course, ultra vacuum, atomic oxygen, and high uh, levels of radiation. And I'm going to go through a couple of these examples. Normally, I have a little bit more time to go through some of the, uh, the experiments, but I'm just going to highlight uh, one or two of these in each one. And then if you had more questions, I can talk to you afterward. Uh, so life sciences, biological systems, you have to really rethink living systems. When you're in microgravity, your body is reacting you know, in a completely different way. Your immune system. Uh, we're looking at muscle wasting and bone loss, and what we've heard our astronauts talk about, and I don't, I'm trying to think of Katie Coleman, who spoke at Space Apps uh, a couple years ago, she was talking about bone loss, and it's almost equivalent to having bone loss at the rate of a 70-year-old osteoporotic woman here on Earth. So you can imagine the types of uh, research and the information that, that that could provide for us, what we're doing on the ground, to help in some of these areas. And you can also see some other areas in terms of plant research, ag bio, which there's some photos of Anusha, where she was actually engaging with some of our plant research on station, uh, microbes, cells, et cetera. And protein crystallization growth, I just wanted to cover this really briefly because uh, Richard Garriott had mentioned that he worked pretty extensively with protein crystallization. And you can see in, in the, uh, the animation uh, that the types of crystals that you see on the space station much larger, more uniform. So imagine what that can do in terms of uh, processes here on Earth or better informing in terms of drug development or uh, looking at other types of research that can benefit from, from protein crystallization growth. So I just wanted to, to put a little nod there for, for Richard. Um, we have also another area that we're focusing on in terms of organ bioengineering. Uh, the previous slide just showed the stats in terms of organ, uh, the organ shortage in the U.S. And this is something that we're looking at in terms of 3D bioprinting organ uh, tissue on station. And this was uh, just an example of, of uh, what had been completed on a parabolic flight. Um, and one of our partners, TechShot, that's uh, looking at this particular area. So we're trying to get some of this hardware on station. Um, moving forward to physical sciences. So I mentioned lack of convection, sedimentation, buoyancy. So you can see in some of the animations here what that can provide for, um, for material sciences research, our industrial partners on Earth. And you can see with Scott Kelly here in terms of the, uh, this water uh, experiment that he did to really show what that can, can mean for uh, some of our, our research that's already being conducted on the ground and how, that, how they can benefit uh, from this on station. So if you'd like to know more about that, material science is also something that we work really closely with. I can talk more about that later. Nanotechnology. Uh, there we go. Uh, so we're currently using uh, smart fluids um, and looking at smart fluids that are actually already being used in, in different systems around the world in terms of earthquake-prone regions. 
uh, we're trying to see if we could um, use some of this technology for disaster relief or try to prevent uh, disasters. And so this is something that, that we're showing in terms of uh, benefiting our planet. And combustion studies. So you can see uh, the, the, the structures in terms of flames on Earth versus flames on the station. The traditional uh, teardrop structure on Earth versus the, uh, the spherical shape on stations. So what, what can that lend to in terms of improving fuel efficiencies on our planet, better engine manufacturing processes, et cetera, reduce pollution? And one of my favorite areas, uh, accelerated materials testing. Um, we've been talking with a lot of different uh, corporate uh, Fortune 500 companies about this. And this is our Missy X platform, which actually the astronauts love to, to, to engage in this because it means that they get to do a spacewalk or extravehicular activity to engage with this hardware. But essentially, because you know, I was mentioning earlier in terms of the extreme conditions in space, the, the hot and cold uh, temperature cycling, uh, imagine the types of data sets that you can get from that or how that can improve material testing here on the ground. One of our partners was actually saying uh, that they currently test some of their products in a desert and they just let it sit there for years. They, they pull that data back and that they use that data to then, you know, try to improve their products. And we're, you know, talking to them and saying, well, imagine if you can get that, you know, uh, accelerated data in days, weeks, months versus waiting years to, to improve your, your products. And that, you know, can translate into billions of dollars. Um, let's see, education, which I mentioned is another main pillar of our organization. And one of my uh, personal passions in terms of STEM education. And our main um, program that we have is called Space Station Explorers really trying to provide um, the space station and allow the, the space station to, or I would say allow students uh, to, to get access to the space station. And, and we have a whole portfolio of different organizations and different um, uh, programs, initiatives that we, we provide for students. So the, the, the video that you're seeing on the left, that's actually our Windows on Earth program. And that, that's actually what Richard Garriott talked about earlier when he was saying that he created the targeting software for Windows on Earth, which I, if Richard was still here, I was going to say thank you because that, that's such an integral piece to what we do now with Windows on Earth. When, through that program, because of that targeting software, we've now aggregated over 2 million images, and now we're trying to turn that into a STEM education, data science, citizen science initiative uh, in terms of creating different opportunities for students with that. And then you're seeing on the, on the right our SPHERES program, so that's another example uh, with our uh, satellites that we have for students where, where uh, they could actually code and uh, create uh, software programs to, uh, to create uh, different um, uh, tests and, and tasks for, for these uh, satellites on station. So that's always a lot of fun to see, and the astronauts love engaging with that too. One other uh, program I wanted to mention is our Genes in Space uh, program. So that actually allows students to um, uh, to send experimentation to the space station. We had our inaugural Genes in Space uh, competition last year, and uh, the winner of that competition, Anna Sofia Bakurayev, uh, she got to send her experiment, uh, it was a mini PCR, to the space station. What better, uh, who better to, to explain that than to hear it from her directly? So I'll just let you watch this video really quick. D minus 10, 9, 8. So now I'm taking the samples that we prepared. And I'm getting ready to actually run them in the PCR machine. 7, 6, 5, 4. My experiment looks at the genetic sequence in space to see if any changes in our genetic sequence might be related to some immune system difficulties that astronauts face. We used this mini PCR machine to make multiple copies of the DNA sequence that we wanted. For astronauts who, especially on if we're looking to long duration space flights in the future, the International Space Station, while it's definitely far away, it's much closer to Earth, much more connected than a Mars mission or a deep space mission. So by understanding these markers, we can possibly then understand more about the immune system in space and potentially keep astronauts healthier. We, we see a couple of processes in astronauts that concern us about a Mars mission someday. 
One is that we see suppression and changes in their immune system. Another is we see a variety of patterns that look a lot like aging on Earth, and radiation damage is one thing that can also induce those problems. So this is a great experiment in putting those two things together and uh, taking a look at what's really going on in the DNA. Just knowing that maybe I'm not in space yet, but a little piece of me is, and not only is a little piece of me going to space, it's also potentially helping the future of space travel, the future of mankind. That's a really powerful thing to me, and I can't wait to watch that rocket launch and know, there we go. Three, two, one. So now we wait. Now we wait for it to come back and see what happens then. <laughs> Of course, Mr. W has that. Okay, going really quick because I only have about seven minutes left, so I'm going to breeze through the rest of this. Uh, remote sensing applications. Uh, so you can see here in terms of the specific areas that we're looking at in relation to remote sensing, Earth observation, and aerospace tech dev and some of the applications that this has as far as uh, uh, chip tracking, asset management, Internet of Things, uh, creating fused data sets that we can use for some of these other areas in terms of global positioning, uh, different types of uh, uh, radar, uh, SAR, infrared light, et cetera, visible imagery. Uh, go, go through that really quickly. If you'd like to know more information, I can talk about that later. Uh, this is a snapshot of, of ship traffic from space to also show the example that what we're doing in terms of fused data sets with asset management. Uh, this is our um, collaboration that we're working on with the United Nations, and it's a, a subdivision of UNITAR, or the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, UNISAD, and we're looking at ways to leverage our data for good. Uh, how can we create, you know, through this Good Earth initiative that can also lend to the uh, sustainable development goals that were created or that were established, rather, in 2015. Uh, tech dev, really quick, I'll go through this. This was the slide I just wanted to show you. It was a survey done by IBM for, uh, with 5,000 uh, chief level executives on what they foresee in terms of uh, particular technologies that are going to be important or particularly important in the next three to five years. And actually, this is a little outdated because now I should put check marks for all of these. We're looking at all of these particular areas with the space station, Internet of Things, AI, cognitive computing, mobile solutions, bioengineering, new energy solutions, et cetera. I also wanted to touch really quick, this is an area that I oversee since I had been uh, in the 3D printing industry for some time, and it's our additive manufacturing efforts, also heading up our on-orbit production or in-space manufacturing, and this was uh, some video taken of the first uh, successful print uh, operated uh, with our additive manufacturing facility on station for Made in Space, and this was done in a matter of hours. They sent the CAD file to, uh, well, I was going to say sent to the space station, but went through a series of, of folks finally got to, to the space station, they were able to print the file, and astronaut Butch Wilmore, you can see there, is holding that print, he was able to use it uh, moments later. That, lend, uh, or that was uh, leading to the next version from that tech demo to the commercial out of manufacturing facility, and this video that you can see here on the right, uh, Brascom, where we were printing recently HDPE or polyethylene, uh, which is ethanol or sugarcane, and um, uh, we're also currently printing right now, which I'm really excited, even though it's another polymer, which is Ultim. So that's happening as we speak on the space station. Uh, our on orbit production efforts, I'm not going to go through that. You can see semiconductor wafers, uh, optical fiber pr uh, products, and frontier technologies. F f finishing the, the presentation with, with this, and then one other video I wanted to show you. So you can see on the right uh, the 4K uh, video that was released by NASA. This was uh, last fall. And it's really demonstrating the power of what we can show in terms of what we're actually doing on the space station, bringing that back down to audiences here on Earth. And I also wanted to show you really quick, uh, Scott, astronaut Scott Kelly had uh, tested a Microsoft HoloLens uh, on station. That's something that we're also looking to further build out in terms of our AR capabilities. I'm just going to show you this quick uh, video so you can hear him talk about Two his experience. To the International Space Station. Just turn the volume up. Thank you. Do you say you can see us? Or oh my god. god. <laughs> In February 2016, Scott Kelly successfully checked out the Sidekick application by making the first Skype call from the space station to mission control. We messed around with it for like two hours and it immediately I sensed this is a capability we could use right now. 
Okay, great. Moving forward really quick. So this also shows you some stats when I was mentioning earlier. What is it that we've done uh, in terms of leveraging the space station for the benefit of humanity? And this really shows you uh, the steps that we've taken to, uh, to maximize uh, that utilization, to leverage this platform for innovation and to better our planet. And uh, you can see here the, the things that we've done in, in that time frame and, and are continuing uh, to build and do uh, over the foreseeable future. Uh, I was going to finish uh, with one quick video. Before I do that, I wanted to show you guys, this is our uh, space station uh, portal or our database. So if you're curious about any of our historical research, experimentation, any R&D that's been done on station, uh, this is the site that you can uh, find out more information about. It's called spacestationresearch.com. And uh, it's a pretty, um, pretty good site in terms of uh, being able to find uh, all kinds of information, not just on experimentation, but our hardware, different partners, et cetera. And I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna finish with one quick video. But before I do that, I just wanted to mention, um, you know, the space station is just one particular area. As you're considering, you know, the, the different things that you're looking at over the weekend and, and with this hackathon, you know, hopefully this has inspired you to consider uh, different areas to, to also look at um, and to, to see, if, you know, as Anusha was mentioning earlier, to, to solve problems. Um, and um, so hopefully, you know, like I said, this has really inspired you to, to consider that. And I'll end with a video and, and have a great rest of the weekend. Thank you. Uh, one second. You have to turn the volume up, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. The International Space Station is the most unique laboratory that exists. There are things that you can learn, things that you can do in space that you just can't do on the Earth. Space Station really provides an opportunity to uh, explore, for example, say medical applications. The aging and the osteoporosis and muscle wasting conditions are greatly accelerated in microgravity. Understanding those phenomena allow us to look at how we can improve treatment of disease here on Earth. What we have is the capability to affect people's quality of life. But it's not just drug companies that can benefit from experiments or research in space, but it's a, a host of industries across the board. But it wasn't always easy to get there. Historically, access to space was limited to companies and corporations which were selected by the government. And what we lost was the true creativity of so many innovative smaller companies that really didn't understand how to get to space. When we were doing the reauthorization of NASA, uh, we wanted to expand the opportunities to different areas of experimentation and also different entities. Recognizing the untapped potential for commercial access to space, in 2005, Congress declared the U.S. portion of the International Space Station a national laboratory. Essentially, it opened up opportunities for research that could be done on the space station that would benefit us here on Earth. Everyday companies and everyday researchers and everyday people can think about using the space station. That's, that's a fundamental change that was never allowed before. Today, we offer opportunities to the researcher that never existed before. Whether it be seed funding to help support the actual project. To access to experts to create hardware. That rocket ride up, the on-station time with the astronaut as your lab technician. What we're doing is really making it as easy as possible for people here on Earth to do space-based research without becoming space experts. Our part of the mission is to help guide these non-traditional innovative users from their traditional labs here on the ground to a very unusual and uh, important asset in space. The ISS National Lab has space versions of hardware that you can often find in laboratories here on the ground. Everything from even animal habitats, plant growth chambers, freezers, 3D printers, earth observation windows, incubators, furnaces, the centrifuges, microscopes. The list goes on and on. So we're working with companies that you would never imagine, and they would never have imagined, using the International Space Station, and they're seeing great results from that. And the International Space Station offers researchers like me an opportunity to find the key variables. It's helping us to pinpoint therapeutic molecules. The space station really provides us a unique opportunity, a unique environment to do some basic and fundamental research that allows us to develop products better. The ISS allows us to do a series of experiments in weightlessness that will have profound impacts for life on Earth. 
Having a U.S. national lab in space has allowed for the formation of a wide range of companies. It's creating a new economy, a sustainable marketplace that has services, commercial products, competition. There's no limit to what we can be doing in a few years. That was great, thank you.